Welcome everybody to our mortgage live stream or my mortgage live stream, Paul Archer's mortgage live stream. Hope you're all well. Good to see you. Uh, looking forward to a great autumn coming up, of course. Things are looking lovely and uh, autumnal, aren't they, at the moment? So the weather wasn't particularly good this weekend, but there we go. Um, got a couple of great topics for you this morning or this afternoon. Depends how you look at it, really, because it's gone 12 o'clock, so it's probably this afternoon. And uh, we're live on Facebook, we're live on LinkedIn and YouTube. So, you know, you can sort of add a few questions if you want to along the way. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, a point of reps versus direct authorization today. D D D A versus AR, just to use the acronyms. And then when I pick up on seminar selling with you, just to give you a few ideas around that. If you're looking to get more business, and I've been talking to some mortgage advisors this morning online, and um, you know they're all looking uh, to generate a little bit more business. The the busy sort of summer stamp duty thing's gone now. We're starting now to generate some new business, some some specialised lending, which they're getting involved in now. So always good to get new business, isn't it? So yeah, I hope you're well. Hope it's all good. Remember to talk, contact me, talk to me, send me emails, whatever you want to do. Happy to talk to you online. So let's get on to um, let's get a good good session going shall we on ar versus da so let me just whiz over to our whiteboard so i'm going to flick over here now and we're going to go to our whiteboard which is our, our way of uh, of training you really isn't it at the end of the day so let's take a look at this this and see what we can do here now the topic that i want to uh, discuss with you is ar versus now yeah, versus da now as you know if you're in the business that stands for appointed representatives versus directly authorization and it does, does really depend on how you like to roll in the business i want to talk to you about the pros and cons of each really and whether you'll want to go from um, an ar to directly authorized because that may well be your objective at some point in the future now if you're new to the mortgage business uh, you've come away from maybe the safety of employment because of course you've always got the uh, the employed uh, position haven't you so there there's a picture there of your bank or building society um, or broker call them what you like somebody who's big enough to employ people so if you're employed you know there's, there's you down there uh, with one or two of these people then you don't have to worry about any of this because you're 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 a, you're a representative of them aren't you? you're employed by them and you sell their products um, if you're a broker you're able to give full market whole of market advice as well but you're employed and that's 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 fine and that's the the choice that you've made now if you decided against employment or you haven't had many opportunities of employment because there's not that many opportunities out there the banks build size all pulling out of giving advice and the big broker world is not quite there yet it's starting to happen you're starting to get private equity money coming into the industry now bulking out brokerages so that they can start an employed kind of mentality growth situation which you know is a really good thing to do but in the meantime many people opt for um, self-employment or ar status appointed representative status and what happens here is you've got to find a principal so you've got to find somebody or something that's going to act as your principal now the principal can be typically a network um, it can also be a broker or or advise a firm call it what you like now we're talking about mortgage advice not not financial advice very different and the idea is that you link in with one of those those principles you might go to a network like primus open work uh, newly something like that or you might join a brokerage that's taking on ARs, and you effectively become an appointed representative of the network or an appointed representative of the broker. You're self-employed, mostly, so you, know, you, you do your own thing, but you're an AR. Now, what does this mean, therefore? It means pretty much that the principle that you log in with has massive responsibility for everything that you do. I mean, I've got a list of seven or eight things up there just to sort of take you through the stuff that the principal has to do. They're, they're, they're responsible for the advice that you give, first of all. So let's put you in here, shall we? There you go. There we are. Hello. There you go. My little stick man there. And there's there's the AI over here. They're broadly they're the same, really, at the end of the day. The broker obviously is a firm that's giving advice, and the network is a firm that's got the representation. But these are all F FCA 
authorized direct, aren't they, these principles? That's the point. And we talk about that in other videos, but the, the principle is directly responsible for the advice that you give. Therefore, they carry the can and they take out the insurances and charge you accordingly. Um, they're also responsible for the financial stability of the AR. Now, the AR, you, or, but you could also be a firm that's got lots of ARs in it. You know, you could be a, a brokerage, for example, with two or three ARs, all of the same network, but you are a firm. So they're responsible for your financial stability and security. They're responsible for your growth and development as well. They provide supervisors, they provide coaches, they provide trainers. Now, good ones like New Leaf, Primus, they've all got training departments who are responsible for training you. They've got supervisors, mentors who are there to help you as much as possible. They're responsible for that. They charge you for it, don't get me wrong, but they're actually responsible for it as well. They're also responsible for systems, processes, sourcing engines, stuff like that. So, you know, you've got to use their computer system. You've got to use their sourcing engine. You've got to use their systems. You've got to follow their processes. You've got to sort, follow their principles, their marketing processes. You can't really do an awful lot on your own. You've got to follow what they tell you to do because ultimately they're responsible, of course, for the advice that you give. And that's what you've signed up for as well. They're also responsible for lender and product provider liaison. So you, you might think you're going to be able to use every single lender going, but as an AR, you are completely reliant upon the broker having, having liaisons with lenders, liaisons with insurance companies. Uh, they have connections with the insurance companies. The network has connections as well. So only, only their insurance companies, only their lenders can you use. If you're if you're part of a club, the Mort League and General Mortgage Club, only can you join that if you're part if it's part of the network. So they're responsible for giving you lenders as well, which is key, isn't it? They're, they're responsible for support, advice, experience, general day-to-day -day running as well. Um, they're also responsible for paying you the dosh. <laughs> they pay you prop fees and commissions. All the money you earn pretty much finds its way through that conduit. You know, lender, proc fee, network to you. Insurance company, commissions, network to you. So, you know, you're going to get money from them, unless obviously they're cut as well. They're responsible for TNC, training and competence, getting you on board, getting you to competent status, getting you competent advisory status, keeping you uh, fit and proper, if you like, along the way. They're responsible for that. And more importantly, they're responsible for control and oversight of you. So think about it, the principal has got an awful lot of responsibilities. So it's cost them time, it costs them money, it's effort, toil, just to keep themselves uh, regulated, if you like, authorised and, and, and doing the job properly under the Financial Conduct Authority. And that's where a couple of problems are beginning to rear their head. The FCA have said uh, last week that they're a little bit concerned, I don't know what their words were, they're worried about what's going on here. The FCA have put the uh, the magnifying glass, so let's just draw a little magnifying glass, shall we? Let's put a little magnifying glass here, just so the straight where it's going, over the brokerage and the, the, the principles, really. That's what they're, they're thinking about. They're worried, you see, that these brokers and these networks, some are doing a really good job, some aren't. Some are lacking in their control and oversight of the ARs that they have under their wings. They've kind of taken them on, given them a bit of software, given them compliance, et cetera, et cetera, and just left you to your own devices, which is great if you're okay with that. But of course, because they're responsible for everything you do, they're not giving you supervision and oversight. They're not keeping an eye on things. And the FCA justifiably quite worried about that. And they're going to bring in some legislation this year or next year to beef up this area. So if you're a principal, a broker or network, and you're not giving proper oversight, supervision, uh, coaching, support to these people, um, super, oversight really means checking, observing. So a supervisor needs to be there. And she observes you regularly, keeps an eye on you, watches your, your, your work, your KPIs, watches your suitability letters and your fact finding, all those good things. That's what, that's what we call about oversight, just keeping an eye. You've got to beef it up. You're going to have to beef it up. And, um, you know, if you want some help, we can help you with the coaching because we do a ton of that. And supervision, we do a supervision in a box. 
So if you want some supervisors quickly, we can do that for you online using video because it's dead easy on video to do that. So that's the uh, the first issue, really, and that's and that's how an AR works. So if you've just joined the trade and you've just got yourself qualified, becoming an AR of a broker or network is probably the right thing for you. It's probably right. And I've got lots of coaching uh, people that we coach that have done directly that. I've got one, one chap that's joined network recently, a couple of network members, great stuff. Some people have joined brokers, and the brokers have taken them on as ARs. Uh, the broker is already up and functioning. They've taken on ARs as self to expand. So it's a great way of getting in, getting your competent advisor stages, get, getting yourself comfortable with the business. But then lies the next part of this discussion, really, because you might be in a situation where you don't want to have this um, control, this oversight, these restrictions, these, this straitjacket, call it what you like. And you might want to segue over away from becoming an AR, and you might want to become directly authorised. Now, directly authorised, as you can appreciate, is where you bypass all of um, this AR business and principles, and you go straight, here we go, let's draw my little picture up there, to the FCA. It's all simple as that. You're directly authorised by the Financial Conduct Authority as you can see from the picture there. So you don't have any of this business. You basically control your own destiny. And that's the beauty of it, really. Think about it. it makes sense, doesn't it? Now, why would you want to do that? Well, there's several reasons why you want to do that. First of all, you're not new anymore. Your, your, your business is established. You've got leads. You've got client bank. It's working really well for you. And therefore, you want to be more autonomous. You want to make your own decisions. You want to control your destiny. Because you can't when you are an AR or a broker, AR or a network, because they control you. This is the way it works. I'm not knocking it. This is the way it works. Um, you might, for example, want to have control over your sales process, how you handle your clients. You might want to change the way the sales process you operate. You might want to change the software that you use. You might want to go to the market, get some new software, some new best advice software, some new sourcing software, because you don't think the one they tell you to use is very good or you don't like it. Um, you might want to recruit some people. You might want to take on some ARs of your own. Now, obviously, if you're directly authorized with the FCA, you can then take on your own ARs. Of course you can, because you're directly authorised. You can do it here and here, but it's pickly. But you've got to do as the network tells you or the broker tells you, because, again, they're responsible for all of the ARs below them. So if you want to recruit, start you know, getting some new advisors into your business, then directly authorised might, the, uh, might be the way. You want to grow. You might want to innovate. Uh, you might want to inject some capital into your business and maybe look at acquisitions or be acquired you know, by a private equity firm or something like that. Um, you might want to grow and put money into business uh, and therefore be gobbled up by uh, an acquisition firm. That may well be what you want to do. Before you do that, of course, you've got to be, make sure you're directly authorised. Now, becoming directly authorised is not easy. Of course it's not. You, know, you can Google it, and there's people that will give you advice on how to do that. There's service companies that look after you, like Paradigm Consulting, for example, jolly good firm. Now, what they do, they're not networks as such. They actually give you, though, the services that many of the networks would have given the AR, and maybe a brokerage might have given you compliance support, etc. The network, for example, will have very good compliance services. I mean, they've got their risk lens on well and truly, haven't they? So you might be able to buy that externally. So although you are directly authorised, you're using a service company to help you with your authorization. I've got uh, one of the guys that I coach. He's directly authorised his firm. He's got three or four people working for him. He actually employs on a, on a freelance basis some compliance support. He, he brings this in. And like I saw, you know, the self-employed person comes in, they're freelance consulting, and they give him all the compliance support he needs because he doesn't want to do it, which is his key. Um, there's different costs in different ways. So that's the, the, the options, really. At some point in your business, you may decide to, to get away from this and go, go that way. You have to be careful. Check the small print that you sign up for in the first place. Um, will they stop paying you commission as soon as you say you want to go DA, for example? Will they provide some support to you to do that? Will they encourage that? It's not a bad thing to do as well. 
Um, will they want to keep your clients? So who, who owns the clients? This is particularly relevant over here. The broker may well own your clients. You think they're yours, but they're actually owned by the broker. The network might feel the same way as well. Obviously, directly authorized, the clients are yours. And that's the route to take long term. So there's a few ideas for you. I hope you found that useful. Bye. <laughs> Great work. OK, let's, um, let's get this all rubbed out now. We'll go on to our next topic for you. I've got another topic for you, which I think you'll like, which is the subject of, um, of seminar selling or the real secret to seminar selling. I want to share that with you now. So let's get rid of uh, our lovely little pictures of um, these ARs and DAs. Aren't we just full of acronyms in this business? Which actually leads us quite nicely onto the next topic, really, because our industry is a bit closeted, really, aren't we? We're a bit, um, we do breathe our own exhaust, as they say, and we tend to have our own technology, our own terminology, and we like to keep it sort of a, a bit of a mystique going on, which comes down to the topic of prospecting for business, get, gaining new clients, client acquisition. And what I want to talk about now with you is the topic of seminar selling. The real secret to seminar selling. Now, seminar selling, this is, as you can appreciate, where you, you run a, a workshop or a seminar or a conference or something, and you bring people in and you teach them all about the topic. Now, they've been going for years now, financial advisors and mortgage advisors to a degree, but mostly financial planners, wealth managers. They hire a posh hotel bring people in nice leaflets, they put some canapes on, on the table, some wine in the corner, and, uh, you know, they, they present financial stuff, you know, educating the customer. And that's the point, really. The objective has never changed, but the venue is beginning to change. So no longer are we looking at doing uh, rooms or hotel foyers or whatever. We're doing this all online. So the model's been around for ages, but we're now migrating to the online one. So you're doing seminar or webinar, as, as we like to call it, of course. The webinar, it's just a play on it. Selling itself. Now, the objective is very much the same. The content is the same. What we're looking to do here is to inform and educate customers, potential customers, with the ultimate aim of getting them to you know come talk to you on a one-to-one -one basis so you can time you can set the clock going you know to start charging a fee so that's the ultimate aim bring a load of people in a room educate them inform them give them information show them how knowledgeable you are <laughs> experienced you are and get them to make appointments to come and see you about their financial planning so that's the objective it hasn't changed so the biggest mistake though that many make is they give too much information. They just blurt out everything they know about financial planning and mortgages, etc., which is fine. But at the end of the day, you've got to realize what, what is what is the real reason why we're doing this and and and, and you know prevent that mistake from happening. So, so the secret then is to hold back a little on what you present to your attendees. And um, there's, there's, there's two secrets here for you. There's two things to think about. The first one is when you, when you present your content, don't just chuck out information because that's what we just call noise. Now, there's plenty of noise on the Internet, noise about mortgages, noise about insurance products, noise about landlord properties, noise about holiday lets no there's just noise everywhere and don't don't just go adding to the noise because that's no good because there's some pretty decent free stuff on the internet you go on youtube now and you key in uh mortgages or financial planning or whatever there's some pretty good stuff there that people put on youtube for free where they finance by advert so it's, it's good quality so don't just add to the noise what you want to do is first of all speak to your audience about the problems that they face so when you when you start talking to them, talk about the problems that your audience are facing so hopefully you get to know who your audience are and, and you've obviously been very selective as to who you invite along so you explain the problems and then you explain the implications of the problems if it continues then you introduce the answers to the problems which makes sense really, isn't it? And then you introduce solutions. 
But what you do here is you introduce generic solutions. Generic solutions. So number one is problems, two are the answers, and three are generic solutions. And I'll tell you why in a second. Let's give you an example. So say, for example, uh, you bought a load of uh, landlords in because you're part of that uh, area and you bought some people in who are potential landlords. And you explain to them the potential problem is this, that, that, that yields from renting properties are falling. So the average buy-to-let property, because of the tax changes, et cetera, et cetera, stamp duty changes, the yields are falling, particularly in high price areas. And you talk about the, the problems that causes, you know, the issues that causes people. They'll all be nodding away. Then you introduce the answers. And the answers might be to move your portfolio to more sort of um, you know, houses of multiple occupations or HMOs, where it's like student blocks, that's all. Or, or holiday let mortgages, which, of course, with staycationing is like a booming industry as well. Or you might look at um, residential conversions. So you're buying a semi a commercial, getting planning to convert it to residential and then hiving off into flats, apartments and renting those out instead. So mass massive uh, yield on those. Big planning permission changes coming up, of course, in that area. But that's all generic, isn't it? You know, generic solutions. And what you then do is you give, you do a call to action. And the call to action is, let's just put that here for you. Call to action is, so there's your solutions. The call to action is that I've given you some solutions. If you want to talk to this on a one-to-one -one where we can tailor those solutions to your situation, let's fix up a 15-minute discovery call so we can talk about this and how we can go about it. So it's quite simple, really. Um, the call to action, one-to-one, -one, virtual. Go, go for video because it's all online, this stuff, you know, video, one one-to-one -one video call with you on, on, you know, on your dollar, 15-minute discovery call to find out if you can help them with their individual circumstances. And then ultimately, of course, you go on to a fact find if you can and you start charging. And that's how you go about doing the, the process of selling on a webinar or a seminar. Now, the second secret to getting the business here is to stop just giving out noise. Stop just giving out general information. We talked about what, no what noise is. And what we do here is we ask you to interpret the noise to tailor it to the clients that you have in the room. We ask you to... Um, not so, so worry too much about generics, but start to, to, to focus on the problems, for example, for landlords rather than general problems for, for property investors. The answers, of course, can be more tailored and more specific to people. Obviously, the individual solution to their needs comes later because that's your call to action. But the second secret is to get rid of just standardized stuff and start to be more precise with the audience you've got in front of you. And that's the key, really. It's not rocket science at the end of the day. It is something that is quite easy to do. It's not tech to, to, to organize and set up. You invite people, use Eventbrite or something to get people along to your meetings and then present them really well, of course. You've got to get your videos right and your lighting right and you know your audio and all those things. It's got to be all top notch. Of course it has. And, and, and it will be because you'll want to make sure it's great. Then you present, you take questions, make it interactive as much as possible. And remember the call to action at the end for you to follow up to fix up this um, this magical sort of, well, I call it sort of the 10 to 15 minutes because that's not frightening for people. Um, discovery call. Again, that's not, not frightening where you and I sit down, talk about your issues, see if we can help you. And if we can help you, we'll take it to the next stage. And that's because when you start charging. And that's how you run webinars. I hope that's been useful. Bye. <laughs> Great work. Okay, well, we've just kind of run over about 25 minutes now, so we'll get a wrap up now. I hope you've uh, found this one interesting. Remember, guys, if you wanted to, you come on live and start chatting, asking me questions. I've got a little chat box over there from the three venues we have, YouTube. And, uh, and LinkedIn and Facebook. You can start asking questions if you want to. Got some exciting things coming up, uh, which a little bit of an infomercial for you. Um, we, we come back from some a week, week away. We're going away for a week away next. We're going to explore. Sounds great. You know, a little walking holiday would be nice. When we come back, we've got the uh, the, the autumn CMAP boot camp starting on the 4th of October. We've been selling quite a few over the weekend, so we've got about um, 13, 14 spaces left on that. So you can come onto that as well, where we get 25 people personally look after them over a four-month period 
uh, to get through their CMAPs whilst they're still working. So you want to find out a bit more about that. We've got the Sales Academy starting up on the, the following day. It's the 5th or 6th of October, where, again, we have a sort of five or six people here. It's a really sort of close group where I teach them everything they need to know about setting up the mortgage business and selling, advising, fact-finding, those sort of things how to set up systems, how to do webinar selling as well. So we teach you and we look after you with lots and lots of coaching. That comes up as well. I'm excited about that. We've also got our coaching coming up. We've got a high-performance coaching system coming up in uh, late October. So lots of things happening to help you, to help you in the mortgage market. Remember, my job is to get you into the mortgage market, make you the very best mortgage advisor I possibly can. And that's what I'm doing, having good fun doing it as well. So Hope that's been great for this week. We won't be here next Monday because I'll be in my holly bobs. I'll be down in um, Exmoor. Actually, we're going to Westwood Ho. Imagine a town called Westwood Ho. Hello, Westwood Ho. Can you hear me out there? I think it was probably because when the ship sailed off from Bristol, people stood on the on the beach at Westwood Ho and go, Westwood Ho. <laughs> there's, some, there's some sort of history to it. But I've never been to that part of Devon and Somerset before, so I'm looking forward to it. So I'll be here next, next Monday because, you know, I'll be busy. I'm sure you get it. Anyway, enjoy your week. Have fun, everybody. And we'll see you soon. Bye. <laughs>